Make you ready for Sunday school. Get your Bible out. Get out of bed. Turn your phone up. Get excited. Melissa, are you excited? I'm so excited. <laughs> We've never done Sunday School like this. It's never been a techno intro for Sunday School. Sunday School, First Baptist Church of Olney. We should pipe that music into the hallways every Sunday morning. Yeah, we just thought it'd be jamming every single Sunday with that. Just we get people dancing down the aisle. Yeah, people bopping down the hallway. Yeah. That would really break the the old image of the Baptists who don't dance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we're going to do Sunday School a little bit different this morning. As uh, you've heard or uh, seen on Facebook or read in an email, uh, hope the announcement gets to you, but we're not having church in person this week, we are going to broadcast live from the sanctuary. We're going to we're recording this Sunday school lesson on July fourth. It's been great. We've seen fireworks. We played Fourth of July bingo. We did. And we uh, ate red, white, and blue food. Yes. And that was good. And then we, you know, put the flag out front. Y'all had gone and bought tiny flags to put in the planners. Yeah. So it's been a really patriotic fourth. So. Uh, we're thankful for for what we have uh, living here. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So we are going to do Sunday school uh, online this morning and broadcast at air this. Uh, uh, hopefully you're watching at 9:45 uh, a.m. or you can catch it all during the day and uh, come back and watch it if you need to. Or it'll also be on YouTube. And so I asked Melissa to sit here with me and to kind of be the class so we can do this and we'll kind of do it in our late night format so if you don't watch our late night show this is kind of what it's like we sit here at the desk uh, late at night and talk about whatever comes to our mind but tonight we're talking about being disciples what's wrong did your earphone freak out and I, yeah is it still making noise no it's okay what happened i don't know it shocked me it shocked you yeah it shocked my ear. That is weird. Something strange. I've never. I was laughing about Baby Yoda back there. Every Maybe time, every time you move your head. Yeah, there he is. Oh, let's see this way. I see Baby Yoda. Yeah, he's so cute, isn't he? <laughs> so Baby cute. Yoda. Yeah, we're keeping him safe. So I'm kind of a Mandalorian like that. So we're gonna do a Sunday school lesson out of the Gospel Project. Now, Melissa's class, you don't. You guys have moved away from Gospel Project, haven't you? Yes, just temporarily, you know, for a change of pace. We've started using Explore the Bible. So we have several classes that use Explore the Bible. Uh, some use Gospel Project. But uh, you have a, a close tie to Explore the Bible, right? I do, I because I write Sunday school for Explore the Bible kids. So the you're, kids you're on the Explore the Bible team. So you're just you're riding for the brand changing over. <laughs> right. To, to do that. Yes. What's it like to write for Lifeway? It's really fun. It's very creative work. It's, I really love it. So when you see a quarterly now or the teacher's guide that I have before me, do you think differently about it than you did before? I think I have a, a better understanding of how much planning and time went into that. So they put a lot of thought into it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they're very they're very conscientious at Lifeway about how they present the Bible and making sure that it's that it's really solid material. Mm -hmm. I was going to see who wrote this lesson. This is 23 session one. This was written by a woman named Jasmine Holmes. Um, she goes to Redeemer Church in Jackson, Mississippi. She's the author of Mother to Son, Letters to a Black Boy on Identity, Hope, and the Contributing Author to Identity Theft and His Testimonies, My Heritage, Women of Color on the Word of God. So 
Jasmine Holmes wrote this, and we're going to read her lesson, go through her lesson. Jesus talking or teaching about discipleship. So um, what do you think of when you hear the word discipleship? Uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I've heard the word a lot, and I've, and I've always thought, well, what exactly is that to be discipled, to be a disciple? Um, I think discipleship, uh, the best definition I ever heard of it was the transfer of truth. Ooh, I'm trying to start my timer back again. Let's go. <laughs> discipleship is the transfer of truth in a relationship. Is that good? <laughs> so transferring truth in a relationship, that is what discipleship is. So it, it's, it has to do with information, uh, but it's not just a, a downloading of information. It's, it's uh, information, but it's the way we learn through a relationship. So the way people back in the time of Christ would learn through a relationship was they would follow their rabbi around. And he was their teacher, but they also lived with the rabbi. Mm -hmm. So that they were they were learners, not just of the information the person was going to give them, but they were learners of their way of life. And so it was a whole it was a whole system, a whole life system of learning. And it's kind of I guess that's kind of the idea you have when you go to a college. It's a kind of an immersive mm -hmm. experience. So we're going to look at um, uh, the first scripture we're going to look at, and I'm going to put it up here, is Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Now, uh, were you an A student? In Ever? Um, I've, I've always been an A, B student. In grad school, I, I was an A student. So you've just gotten better. Right, I've just yeah, ripened yeah. with age. I've always been sort of an A, B guy uh, with an occasional C. But I did make all A's and B's in seminary. I'm not yeah. making any C's in seminary. But I, I did make a C in law school. I made a, And I made a C and a D in college. I made a D, C in college. I can't remember. I made a C or a D in college algebra. Mm. And I made a C or a D in... Uh, what was the class where you had advanced to, grammar? You had to diagram the sentences. That's mm -hmm. not my jam. I'm I not loved a, that. Class. I'm not a sentence diagrammer. <laughs> I could care less for that. But my problem was I just didn't go to class. So you know, waste what's interesting of money. is both of those classes. That's the same type of thinking, math and yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, diagramming. It's not what I'm about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I just I it's feel it. I feel it. Yeah, I feel <laughs> it. I don't understand it. But um. You know, some of us were good students and some of us struggled more. Some of us had a hard time sitting still. Some of us have a hard time paying attention. But one thing we all looked forward to and understood was a big day was the first day of school. Mm -hmm. Did you love the first day of school? Oh, yes. Except tell us about your high school experience on the first day of school. Oh, <laughs> That was a bad first day of school, wasn't it? That was a rough first day of school. So what happened that day? Well, you know, first day of ninth grade, and I went to a tiny school. I had 27 kids in my graduating class. Mm -hmm. It tells you how small our school was. So you would think it would be no big deal to walk into this building. Yeah. But it still was really scary because, you know, over the summer between eighth and ninth grade year, you wonder, do I have the same friends or how have things changed over the summer? Mm -hmm. And my mom had bought me this really cute outfit a plaid little tunic with black stretch pants. No, no, stirrup pants. Stirrup pants. I remember stirrup I rem pants. I remember them well. And I never wore them, but I remember the girls wearing them. I walked in the front door, and there was this group of senior boys standing by the office, just grouped around, kind of just laughing at everything. And I walked through there, and there was just this slight little slope of the floor, <laughs> and my foot slipped. <laughs> And so I did like this, you know, Cat trying on the to roller keep skates. from falling down. Yeah. I didn't fall, but they all laughed really big all the way down the hall while I was walking. I could hear them laughing. And you just acted like they weren't there, right? I just ignored them. <laughs> and then I got down there and then and another girl who was really cool and pretty had on my outfit and she looked a lot cuter. <laughs> who wore it best? <laughs> she definitely, she definitely wore it best. She was rocking it better than you were. <laughs> Yeah. Well, on the first day of school, the teacher sets the expectations. So in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is doing is he's 
he's not just setting expectations of how he expects his students to live, but he's resetting all the expectations about how we think we relate to God or how, and how we relate to his law and his commands. So what, what had happened for all these centuries after the law had given is people had thought that the way that you lived, your righteousness was an outward thing. Mm -hmm. So imagine how much easier it would be if your righteousness only had to be outward. It's all about appearances. It's all about looks. Wouldn't that, I think it would be easier. Maybe it's hard. Maybe it would be more exhausting to keep up appearances. But if you were just worried about how the outside was and not how the inside was, well, that's mm -hmm. what he was saying about the Pharisees and Sadducees. The, the main religious people, he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You, you've, uh, uh, you, know, you, you look great on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead. Mm -hmm. Well, so what Jesus was calling the people that were listening to the Sermon on the Mount, um, were sitting there listening, what he was calling his disciples to, was a much deeper way of, of knowing God and of following uh, his commands, not just on the outside, but to, to follow them on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so the, you can think of this, uh, these passages in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, sort of like Jesus uh, being a teacher on the first day of school saying, okay, here's what we're going to be doing. And, and it was like this last year, but now it's going to be like this this year. Maybe a lot like going from junior high to high school. Mm -hmm. I remember we would ever seem like everywhere we would go, they would, they would yell at us in the first day of school how they're not going to hold our hands anymore. Right. You know, I realized last year the teachers held your hands. You know, <laughs> when you guys were in sixth grade, you know, the teachers were holding your hands. Then we get the next grade. I know when you guys were in seventh grade, the teachers were holding your hands. I know you guys when you're eighth grade, the teachers were holding your hands. <laughs> and I, and all the way all the way up until I would say college, they were they actually did hold our hands. <laughs> It's like you could, you know, they made sure everything was going to be okay, which, you know, you love that about your teachers. But Jesus is setting the tone here. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. So you want to read out of the quarterly for us? You can sure. read 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Yeah, so here we've got a couple of different ways that Jesus is telling, ways he is expecting his disciples to live in the world. He's expecting his disciples to live as salt and light. So, uh, you know, we go buy food at the store and we, you know, we put it in the refrigerator. But back in those days, uh, they would put, I'm going to turn my watch is dinging. They would put their, their meat in the, into salt or in salt and preserve it that way. Uh, the salt would function as a preservative to keep the meat from going rotten. And so basically what Jesus is saying is, you know, you are the salt of the earth. You are here, and you've got sort of a preservative function. Um, you're to keep this place from going rotten mm -hmm. by your presence here. Uh, and he says, and if you become unsalty, if you if you lose that preservative um, aspect of your of your discipleship, if you're following me, then you're not good for anything anymore. Mm -hmm. So we know one of our functions is to be a preservative. Uh, because it seems like things get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But we're here sort of to slow that process down. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus is saying when he's talking about salt. He's not just talking about being flavorful. Um, salt for them was a way that they preserved foods so they could survive. It was vital. And, he, you know, I think we're a vital preservative in this world. Um, but but what is the what would be the problem if that's all we were? It doesn't really, you know, that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, I think Doug Wilson, I saw a podcast where he was saying, or vlog or whatever you'd call it, where he said, there's lots of people who basically pick up on that idea that you're better off the less debauched you are. Like, you know, now, now it takes a, some people take them a long time before they realize that, that actually debauchery is bad for you. Mm -hmm. 
and and the more debauched your culture is the the worse off the culture is so everyone needs these preservatives and it doesn't necessarily take a saved person to be a preservative in the world they can stand up and say that's going to harm you because god just gives people you know he was talking about jordan peterson saying jordan peterson is is common grace on fire you know mm -hmm. uh whenever non-christians hit upon biblical truths well they're hitting on that because it's god's common grace to allow everyone to understand it that yeah killing people's bad uh, having a promiscuous sex life is bad it's going to harm people it's going to hurt you it's going to hurt others eventually it's going to tear up your society mm -hmm. so that you know doesn't necessarily take a christian to realize that but then you bring in verse 14 that you read you're the light of the world a city on a hill cannot be hidden and no one put, lights a lamp and puts it under a basket you know and that's the other thing we're supposed to be doing. You can't just say, yeah, I'm going to be in the world to keep the world from being bad. You, you, you know, you sang it in Sunday school, right? Put it under a bushel. No. Yeah. And we all said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put it under a bushel. But what happens is sometimes we, as we grow older and we should be letting our light shine, we might come, we might not have a balance here. We might feel more like, hey, we're just gonna, we're just here to make sure nobody gets debauched, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, what we're to part of our preservative function and part of the way it's going to work is we're going to proclaim who Christ is. Um, we're going to let our light shine before men that they would see our good works, they would see our preservative function, and then praise the Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. So there's an idea that we're we're doing good works, we're letting it shine. But the, the point of it is to drive people to the Father. And the way they come to the Father is through Jesus Christ's Son. So by preaching the gospel, by preaching the Word of God, we're going to have, to have this effect. We are going to give people, hey, here's what God's commands are. But whenever we point them to the Father, we're always giving them hope. Mm -hmm. It makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're giving people hope. So um, as she says here, um, says we, we put, having that little light shining might put a target on your back but jesus rather than teaching his followers to fear the darkness jesus talks about light here he talks about light that drives away the darkness jesus had a confrontation with darkness at the cross and he calls us to be bold in the face of ridicule isolation and persecution even when they're laughing at you first day of freshman year yeah right yeah uh, <laughs> jesus's identity is the true light of the world reminds us that no matter what the results of our shining for his glory he will be victorious so that's our mission as church as, as a church and as disciples is to be a preservative be the salt and to be the light so jesus disciples are to be salt and light point number two point number two so this is matthew oh man see if i can do this I was trying this earlier and I, and I goofed it up. So the next scripture is Matthew, is that working? Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. I'll read it. Jesus says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have the reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is a hard one, right? Mm -hmm. what, why, do you think, why do you think we're so tempted to practice righteousness for our own personal glory? That's a big question at 1130 at night, isn't it? Why are we <laughs> what are some ways we're tempted to practice our righteousness for our own personal glory. What are some ways? Yeah. How are we for, tempted to okay. do that? Or how do we do that? Well, I think that, I think that the desire to kind of steal God's glory is the root of, of probably all sin. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very easy because the world tells you constantly that you should be rewarded. You should be recognized. You should be appreciated. And if you aren't, then, mm. you know, you're, you're being mistreated. And so I think it's hard for us to separate that sort of philosophy of, of an ungodly world from our feelings as followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting that we do live in a world where pretty much anything you do can be broadcast to so many more people than you could have let know what was going on. Mm -hmm. The problem with us, so, so here, here's the context of the passage. He keeps pointing a finger at their preachers, their religious leaders. And what those Pharisees would do is they would actually, whenever they came to drop their tithe off, they would have a trumpeter come in. Like they had their own little Doc Severinsen. Remember that guy on the Tonight Show? Are you too young for that? No. You remember Doc? He was the crazy dressing trumpet player on Carson? I don't remember. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? I'm not that much younger than you. Your, your, parents, your parents were just letting you watch late night shows. Your parents weren't letting you watch Johnny Carson? I don't, I mean, I might have seen Johnny Carson. I mean, I saw it, I saw it later. Doesn't matter. Anyway, they had a trumpeter come in. Who's a trumpeter you know? Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong. <laughs> so they had a Satchmo come in. <laughs> I'm going to blame my trumpet. <laughs> what a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> And so he, he comes in. So they have a trumpeter come in and like announce to everyone and they would wear like loud clanging things just to announce and, you know, bring their marachas in and tambourines just to make a ruckus in the market so that people would applaud for them when they gave their gift. That's crazy. It's crazy. But what mattered to them again was outward righteousness. It didn't matter what was going on in the inside. Well, Jesus is flipping all that upside down saying those guys are hypocrites. They, they they want the applause. They don't want to serve God. Their hearts are in the wrong place, even though their actions are right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. They weren't acting out of faith. Here's the problem with our wicked hearts. It doesn't matter if you're a Pharisee 2,000 years ago or if, you're, or if you're me. The problem, the reason that Jesus says, he says, when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So you're giving maybe in secret. What is he saying there? Is he saying that you should always give a secret gift? Is he saying every gift should be anonymous? Do you think that that's right? Mm, I don't know that that's what he's saying. Because when, remember when Barnabas bought the field, somehow that fact made it into the Bible. Yeah. I mean, there, there, were, there was collections taken up. Paul would praise people for their gifts. The Philippians he would praise them for their gifts that they'd given. He would brag on churches that had supported him. So the giving was not a secret. But what, what Jesus is saying is, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, it seems like it's more about the, the heart behind what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because our hearts are so wicked, I think Jesus, what he's saying here is, okay, you need to basically, because your heart is so sinful and prideful, you all, he's saying you need to be able to give over here without this with this hand, without this hand knowing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Somehow you've got to hide from your wicked, deceitful, prideful heart what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what he means by don't let your right hand your left. Because if, if your right hand finds out what your left hand is doing, it's going to put it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so so it'd be like, hey, look what I just did. You know, and it's, and it's one of those things. And I'm not, I'm not knocking you if you do this. It might even encourage you. I don't know. But there's so many people, they sit down to have like a Bible study. But they can't sit down and have the Bible study unless they take a picture of what they're doing and tell everybody what they're doing. Uh, there's preachers that I know on these Facebook boards that that's what like every day there's some of them. And they're like they take a picture and they're like, here's my study set up. What's yours look like? Well, we're not all bragging that we're studying right now, buddy. You know, <laughs> but the, I think there's a there's an element of and of course, I'm judging their motives here, which I shouldn't be doing. But I think there's an element, if that was me, of saying Hey, look what I'm doing. I'm doing the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You know, this is my, I'm doing, I'm sacrificing right now by having a really expensive cup of coffee in a, in a, in a lowly lit office with 15 different highlighter colors so I can make the best sermon ever. Right. And all you other loons are going to be writing your sermon at 10 o'clock on Saturday night because you procrastinate and you can't figure out what you want to say. <laughs> and I look at his post, I think that's me, <laughs> you know. But we don't want our right hand or left. We, we don't, we almost have, our, we're so sinful. We almost have to hide from ourselves what we're doing so that we will be able to be rewarded in heaven rather than rewarded here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's an idea that is in uh, Wearsby's commentary, which I thought was really good to, to just talk about the internal struggle we have with 
wanting the glory for the good things mm -hmm. that we do. Yeah. So I know we're all tempted in those ways uh, when we have any gift, especially uh, may maybe maybe it's less with money than anything else. You know, it's kind of easy just to, I mean, you write a check, nobody's, I mean, people don't really see that. I mean, I, I very rarely hire the trumpet player, um, <laughs> you know, but, but, and I rarely, I'll, I'll be honest, I rarely think about the giving being rewarded in heaven. Mm. I mean, I, I just don't, I mean, th there's a truth there. And especially there's a big truth on the days where we don't physically meet and we still need you to bring your offering in. All right. So, um, you know, bring that regular gift in. And, you know, no one's going to, I don't know who gives, only Sandy does. But it's amazing to think that such a simple act of just giving a check with a regular contribution, that that actually is storing up treasure in heaven. I mean, it's such a it's better place. It's such a better place to put your money than in the stock market or buying something that's going to rust away or be destroyed or moths are going to get it. One of the saddest things I ever experienced was when we found all those cashmere sweaters on sale at the Dillard's Clearance Center. And I remember my, I had this red cashmere sweater. It was the nicest sweater I ever had. And I remember the day I pulled that out of the, out of the drawer and it had holes in it. And yeah. I thought, you're so right, Jesus. <laughs> I should not have stored away my treasure here. <laughs> but, we, but when we, when we give, um, I guess our talent and there actually is many, there are, or there are many times where you and I sing. And when we sing, when, when we're finished, people clap. And it's pretty easy in that moment to just think, Oh, that was my reward, mm -hmm. you know? And am I fine to do these things if no one's clapping? You know, so uh, who who are we who are we doing that for? So uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you just prompted the thought that you know when we're giving money to the church, it really is you know it's it's a double it has double eternal consequences to do that mm -hmm. um, because not only are you storing up your treasures in heaven, but the money you're giving is making an eternal impact on other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you're giving money for missions to go around the world and for people to hear the name of Jesus for the first time. Yeah. And, and that's one thing that you'll never know how much was done, you know, with when you've given those gifts and we send that money to the mission boards, to the seminaries, to the home mission board, to all these different agencies. And we'll, we'll never know what the impact was until we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people will be in heaven because that you did give to the Annie Armstrong offering mm -hmm. and you could have spent that on something else and you'll find out someone's in the kingdom because if you're good. So, um, and, and people are like, Oh, that's silly. Well, I don't think it is. I think it's just the, this is the reality of I it. I think it's fact. Yeah, yeah, it's fact. <laughs> I think it's great. So, um, and then you, then you know, the the way I think we have to have in our mind is, I can get applause from First Baptist Church of Olney for singing a song, but imagine how, as great as y'all are and as appreciative as you are, how much applause from heaven would be. Mm -hmm. It would make the human applause seem like nothing. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be salt and light. And the second point here is that we're supposed to obey uh, for God's glory, not for our own glory. So again, this is a turning it upside down of what the Pharisees had done. And the third point, I want to keep this a short Sunday school lesson. But the third point is our, Jesus's disciples are to live purposefully. So let me, let me write this one up here. Are you impressed with my... Technical skills here. So impressed. Okay, I'm going to try this. It's going to work. Boom, there it is. Matthew chapter 7, 19 through 24. Uh, you want to read that one? Sure. Uh, now, this, I think, is one of the scariest passages in the whole Bible. Be warned. This is scary. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Hmm. And then there's a parable there after that. Um, we're, the, the, the point of the lesson is that we're supposed to live um, purposefully, that our lives have a purpose. You don't plant an apple tree just to get shade. Mm -hmm. You know, you plant the apple tree to get apples. And, you know, Jesus says, you will know that you're, that you will know they're my disciples by the fruit that they bear. Okay. And if it's not bearing fruit, the tree doesn't get to stick around. They tear it out of the ground and put one in there that'll bear fruit. Um, and again, this is that we're thinking a lot about at that time, you can't afford to have a fruit that doesn't, a tree that doesn't bear fruit. Mm -hmm. um, so he's saying, what, what will that look like? What will it look like? Uh, what will the fruit look like? And it's interesting that prophesying, driving out demons and miracles, that people will have done these things and they will go to Jesus and he will say to them, um, or he says to them, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord will enter my kingdom. They've, they've said he's Lord. They've done all these things in his name. And he says, I don't know you depart from me. Mm. I mean, you lawbreakers, that is the scariest passage. I think in all scripture for us, because we should constantly be examining our hearts saying, well, <laughs> You know, I'm doing things in Jesus' name, but is does do I know Jesus and does He know me? Um, he says the 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 distinguishing thing there in verse 21 is it's only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, again, there's a distinction to make here. You're not saved because you do good works, but you do good works because you are saved. There's a genuine loving of God. And if you love God, His law, and and you and you love to obey Him, His your love for Him and your love for others does not conflict with doing the moral law. Mm. Okay, loving people and loving God is always going to be consistent with righteousness. Like that's the standard. That's what we should want to to do. Um, that's the will of the Father in heaven. You can say, well. You know, maybe the, like, again, I think we talked about this in the sermon last week, thinking about the will when we were saying the uh, kingdom come, thy will be done. What is this will he's talking about? It's not the mysterious will of God that we can't know. Mm -hmm. It's what's been revealed to us. The one who is obedient. Read First John. This is what First John's about. We skate around this, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Like this, other than just saying to people, hey, the fact that you don't really care and you don't have a desire to follow God's law should indicate to you that you're going to hell. Mm. You mm. say you're a Christian, but you're always looking for a loophole. So the pe what is a scary thing about all this COVID crisis and having not really gathered the whole church back together since it started is how many people this has not affected one bit. Mm -hmm. They weren't in the word before they weren't having true Christian fellowship with anyone before they are these people that are not going that Jesus, they don't know Christ. And yet they've gone to Bible school. They've been baptized. They've said a prayer that they thought worked as an incantation. It's a hard teaching, isn't it? Isn't yeah, it? it is. But that I think maybe a, I saw a survey yesterday that said pastors were surveyed and um, six out of 10 Southern Baptist pastors were fearful that their congregation loved the United States of America more than they love God. Did you see that? Mm -mm. And I'd be like, eh? I've been in some churches where I'd wonder, you know, where there would be more of an uproar over, over something to do with the country or politics than there would be over unrighteousness, mm -hmm. you know? Um, hey man, it, this is a, Hey man, <laughs> this this is a serious thing and you know it's there there's a so, <laughs> this, this is really dating me in my christian youth culture days but the uh, degarmo and key song ever since summer branham got a keytar i've been looking <laughs> up old degarmo and key uh but where he's where eddie degarmo sings this uh or dana key i guess as it is sings a song about i don't want to be a casual christian 
Well, you don't because casual Christians don't go to heaven. I mean, yeah. you know, Jesus is saying, hey, guys, it's more than just about outward righteousness, looking for loopholes and being like these hypocrites over here. Mm -hmm. you're, you'll know your mind because your desire will be to, to do the will of the Father. You know, that is a huge, that's a huge difference. And I'm all, often fearful when we call people to repentance and put the standard in front of them that they're going to be like all those disciples that were following Jesus in John 6 and just walk away. Mm -hmm. You know, when he says, hey, if you want to follow me, drink my blood and eat my flesh. And all those people are like, mm, that that's not why we're following you around, man. Mm -hmm. We're following you around because we saw what you did with the loaves and the fish and you fed us all. and We were all full stuffed. So we're following you around for that to eat that food, yeah. not the food you just told us. We're not here to be a cannibal. Mm -hmm. We're not here to actually take you in fully into our lives, into our very be into our very core of our being, like taking someone's blood and flesh into your stomach. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty heavy commitment. We're not willing to go there, mm -hmm. but they all walked away. And Jesus said, you guys want to go to, and Peter said, where are we going to go? You're, you got the words of life. You know, they were the ones whose lives have been changed. They weren't going anywhere. Yeah. So our, it's sad that our, you know, our, our, it's sad that our fear would be due to COVID. We would lose half our church or something. Mm -hmm. And I pray we don't. I pray. I pray that's not the case. I don't think it will be to you. I don't, no, I don't think I don't so. Think so. <laughs> but I think we're going to lose some because they weren't really with us. Yeah. It was, when it was convenient, they were with us. And now that they've gotten used to another thing that was convenient, we'll probably never see some again. You know, and that's sad. And that's probably an indication that, you know, we didn't disciple and we we weren't living, we weren't salting and lighting the way we should have been mm -hmm. um, to make someone in our presence realize that they were lost. Yeah. So that's that's a tough thing. Here's the question here. What is the difference between outward compliance to Christ's commands and inward conformity to Christ's lordship? What is the difference between just outwardly complying and the inward conformity to Christ's lordship or, or truly receiving Christ as Lord? When do you think you understood the difference there between just following rules and actually desiring to know Christ through obedience? trying to think myself when I, I would don't say, know I don't know that I could pinpoint I would say it happened later in my life than I would want to admit yeah. like I would say I'd probably even been on staff at churches before I realized it mm. you know and I think I was saved I'm not doubting whether I was saved or not on that yeah I'm just saying coming to an understanding that discipleship was not but because I think as we grew up in youth group culture in the 90s and the 80s which is why youth group is really been such a disastrous failure since for the last 50 years since they've tried it mm -hmm. kids the vast majority of kids who've left the youth group have never come back to church um, because basically it was like a be good competition mm -hmm. who can be good who can be the best i think it's back to that old saying you know that idea you know do you have a relationship with the rules or do you have a relationship with the lord yeah and i, I think for for a long time, you know, I, I did have a real relationship with the Lord, but I had more of a, the rules, rules are easy for me, mm -hmm. you know, following rules. Like I, I like for things to be cut and dry. This is what we can do. This is what we can't do. Yeah. And then I can walk the line, you know, but the problem with that is, is that in the process of doing that, of being a rule follower, you can get a very hard heart mm -hmm. toward other people toward the Lord, you, you just can get very hard. Because your reward is following the rules. Right. As and, opposed and you, to. And you feel very self-righteous. Yeah, you feel good about yourself. You've got, you know, that's, you know, you you follow the rules because it gives you a great sense of, uh, of justification, like self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. And then the bad part about it is when you break the rules. Mm -hmm. You feel like God doesn't love you. Exactly. And it's a complete misunderstanding of God's grace, of the gospel, of who Jesus is, of how we're supposed to relate to him. It gives you such a skewed understanding of the things of God, where as we could look at it through, 
I'm going to obey these rules because and obey and follow these commands, but not because I'm trying to feel good about myself and and justify myself, but because through following and through obedience, there's joy in in the Lord. There's uh, it's it's not a matter of trying to please Him, but it's a joy of growing closer to Him in the in that relationship. Mm-hmm. To say, I know my the the very deepest part of my heart doesn't want necessarily to walk in this manner, but I'm going to choose step by step to not look at this, to not read this, to not listen to this, to not say this out loud, to not harbor bitterness and anger towards someone. I'm going to choose not to do what my my prideful heart really wants to do. This is really hard. We don't do a very good job with this, but that's what we, it takes a lifetime of, of just even realizing what the way you're living. But we say, I'm, I'm, instead of this, I'm going to trust that you are telling me the truth, that you're right, that if I'll obey you, there'll be joy in it. Mm-hmm. So the way that we're trusting Jesus every day, don't just say you trust Jesus and do whatever you want. Talk whatever you want. Well, I know I cuss, and I know I do this, and I know we watch this, and, but I trust Jesus. No, you don't. If you really trusted Jesus, you'd obey him. You don't trust him. You don't love him. You don't care because you don't do what he says. There, you would have no other friendship. There's no other way you could say you have a friendship with anybody. If you said, "Well, I know I, I know I scratch his car, and I know I set his house on fire, and I know I do all," that, but you know, I really, I really trust my best friend. I really love my best friend, you know. Or say, "Listen, I, I tell you, I really, I really trust and have faith in my best friend, but I would never get in a car with him. I wouldn't even ride a bicycle with him. Uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't. I don't even like walking in, down the street next to him. I, I dang, you know, he he always uh, does the wrong thing. He always hurts me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's basically what you're saying whenever you say I trust Jesus. But when he when he commands you to do something, you don't trust him. You mm-hmm. think he's leading you astray. He's leading you the wrong way. That should be your wake up call that you don't trust God. You don't love God, and you're lost. And so what you do when you realize that is that when you realize, well, I'm saying that I'm a Christian, but I got no fruit. There's no evidence in my life that there's any true desire to follow Christ. You hit your knees and say, I'm doing this all wrong. And maybe you maybe you do have a real relationship with Christ, but you but you you've just not been discipled in this way. Ask God to show you how you can through obeying him and trusting him, you can know him more because I'm no expert in this and I'm the pastor, you know. Uh, this is this is hard hard stuff. So um, I, I would say, don't go looking for the loopholes. Um, there's danger there, but truly d- think about each moment when you have a choice to make, how you can know Christ more through trusting Him than by disobeying Him. Mm-hmm. And so those are so we're going to salt and light. We're going to. Have a purpose in our obedience, which is to, uh, which, oh, no, no, that's the third point. We're to obey for God's glory and not our own and have a purpose in our obedience. So I'll, I'll finish with this quote. The true disciple expresses the sincerity of his confession of Jesus, of Jesus's identity. So the true disciple expresses the sincerity of his confession of Jesus' identity as the Lord through obedient living. Jesus was not pitting obedience against faith but was insisting that obedience is the necessary expression of true faith by Charles Quarles. So that's a great, great point to end on. Mm. So thank you for watching today. Did you have any final thoughts or comments on that? No, I enjoyed that lesson. Yeah, I think it's a good lesson. And uh, we'll hopefully be back on, back on campus um, next, uh, Next week, which will be the 12th, we, we're going to move Karan Jackson's concert back to the 26th, so don't worry about missing that. We'll probably have to move maybe the nursery back another week before we can open that. But don't lose heart. Everything's going to be okay. Right, Baby Yoda? Right? Sorry. Little Baby Yoda back there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm peeking his head over there. <laughs> so everything's going to be okay. Uh, don't don't despair over this. And, you know, uh, you know what it says in Third Jambalaya Chapter 2, right? When God gives you lemons. Oh, I thought you were going to say, blessed are the flexible. Those are, yeah, that's in that's in uh, Third Jambalaya chapter 3. <laughs> Third Jambalaya chapter 2 says that uh, when God gives you lemons, make lemonade. So I'm going to start thinking in those terms right now because what I'm realizing is that COVID, I think, is going to be with us for a long time. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. Uh, at least, at least in the way that we're having to sort of the way we're doing things, I think it's going to affect school. I think it's going to affect a lot of things. So we need to start getting our mind in that, that mindset that we thought this might just be a two or three month thing. It may be a longer period thing than that the way we're affected by it in our programs and what people will consider safe. And, and there'll be, you know, 30, 40% of the church that I would frankly probably be a part of that'll just say, let's meet up there at the church and have church. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to have to figure out a way to shepherd those who aren't quite there because of the, of concerns with COVID, which are legitimate and valid. So, um, we're, this is going to stretch us as a church, make us better. So let me pray for us and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, close out and then we'll have our worship service. We'll air at 1045. That'll be live. This is pre-recorded, but uh, that'll be live at 1045, uh, live from the sanctuary. And we'll, we'll uh, do the sermon on the fourth petition in the Lord's Prayer, which is give us this day our daily bread. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you... Uh, have condescended that you've come down to us to show us uh, what you desire, even though you're in heaven, even though you're holy, even though we can never, never even think the way you think or, or uh, act the way you act. Uh, your ways are higher than ours. Your thoughts are higher than ours. Yet you've, you've come to our level to show us the best way. And that best way is Jesus Christ. So we pray that we would listen to Jesus, that we would obey these commands that we've read today and to understand that the way that we follow and trust is by a love for obedience, uh, to, to a love to do what is right and not to always be looking for ways out of that. So Father, give us a, we, we can't do this on our own. We need you to give us a genuine love for what is right because our hearts are always trying to steal glory. They're always trying to do what's wrong. So Lord, help us uh, to live out these words, not just to hear them, but to live them out every day of our life. Father, make our church strong. We pray for those in our church that are our members that are suffering from COVID right now. Father, that are dealing with shortness of breath and, and, and terrible symptoms. Father, we pray that you would uh, touch their bodies, heal them, cause this COVID to, 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 to uh, die, help their immune systems to fight it off. Uh, we pray for a miracle of healing. And we just ask that you would do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me. See y'all in church in just a minute.